Perhaps the most famous debate about space and time in the history of philosophy occurred in the Leibniz Clark correspondence of 1715 1716. Samuel Clark, acting as a surrogate for his friend Isaac Newton, made the case for space and time as absolute empty containers in which objects res reside and events unfold. The great German philosopher Leibniz countered that it is meaningless to ask whether the universe could have been created 10 minutes earlier than it was, or 40 meters further to the west than it was. There is no external spatial or temporal measuring stick that would allow everything to be moved as a whole together. Instead, space and time for Leibniz emerge from the relations between entities, thus paving the way for Einstein nearly two centuries later. It seems to me that both of these views must be wrong. Here, like this? Can you hear fine now? All right. It seems to me that both of these views must be wrong, even though I feel closer to Leibniz. Space cannot be relational for the simple reason that it is both relational and non-relational. If space is where things meet, it is also where they stand at a distance from each other. At this moment, we are obviously in relation with Cairo and Tokyo by standing at a certain measurable distance from them. Yet we are also not in relation with them insofar as they currently exceed our grasp. It takes work to travel to Egypt or Japan, and even once we arrive, we will not have exhausted their many secrets. Insofar as relation means contact, space is the zone of both contact and non-contact. If objects engage in spatial relations, then at the same time, they also withdraw from these relations into a private inner life that might be described as subspatial rather than superspatial. With time, it is different. Here, a relational approach is more successful, though a different sort of relational approach than Leibniz had in mind. But to explain both of these claims, it is first necessary to give a brief account of object-oriented philosophy that I've tried to keep as clear as possible. For Edmund Husserl, phenomenology was a way to root philosophy in unshakable immediate evidence. The natural sciences may have greater social prestige in our time than philosophy, but as Husserl sees it, the sciences give us mediated theories rather than direct evidence of whatever they discuss. For example, physics demonstrates that a mailbox, like all physical things, is made up of quarks and electrons, or perhaps of tiny vibrating ten-dimensional strings. Yet none of us have ever seen such minuscule particles. And however good the evidence for their existence may be, for Husserl it must ultimately be grounded in phenomenological experience, the only source of direct insight we have. Instead of reducing the mailbox downward to the unseen corpuscles of which it is built, we can instead describe our experience of the mailbox in intimate detail, finding ever subtler perceptual layers and increasingly shadowy dimensions in our experience of it. Philosophy suspends or brackets all consideration of a real material world and becomes instead a painstaking description of the phenomenal. The price Husserl pays for this maneuver is a deeply idealist conception of philosophy in which nothing exists except as the actual or potential target of some observing consciousness. Even if the mind is always already outside itself pointing at objects, these objects are still just phenomena in consciousness, not real autonomous entities that lead an independent life outside of being recognized or perceived by us. But Husserl is not a typical idealist. When reading Husserl, just as when reading Merleau-Ponty, he so often feels like a realist. Husserl feels like he is discussing the autonomous existence of mailboxes, blackbirds, battles of centaurs, even though these objects exist only as correlates of our consciousness. The reason for this is that despite being an idealist, Husserl is almost certainly the first object-oriented idealist in the history of philosophy. His teacher Brentano paved the way for phenomenology by reviving the medieval concept of intentionality. The difference between mental acts and physical events, says Brentano, is that mental acts always point at some object. To hear is to hear something, to wish is to wish for something, to judge is to judge about something, to hate is to hate something or someone. This is sometimes misinterpreted to mean that consciousness always points at some object in the outside world. And this has led in later years to misunderstandings about the meaning of the term intentionality. Yet Brentano is quite clear that intentionality means imminent objectivity, imminent inside the mind. Conscious acts are aimed at objects inside, not outside the mind. This is already obvious if we consider that it is possible to perceive hallucinations, wish for non-existent things, make judgments about the powers of non-existent creatures, or fall in love with charlatans and fakes. In short, Brentano's philosophical psychology was focused on what is imminent in the mind. But that left open the question of how this imminent sphere related to any outside world. <coughs> a clean and candid solution to this problem was attempted by Brentano's exceptional Polish student, Wardowski, who doubled up the world into an object outside the mind and a content inside the mind. Also among Brentano's students at the time was the older but greener Husserl. Husserl never liked Wardowski's approach, so it seemed to make our knowledge, a mere phenomenal knowledge of content, unable to grasp the object itself. 
In Husserl's famous example, the Berlin of which I speak is the same Berlin that exists in the real world. There are not two Berlins, one in the mind and one outside the mind, according to Husserl. But what is often overlooked is that Husserl did not simply eliminate Twardowski's distinction between object and content. Instead, he preserved both terms while collapsing them into the phenomenal realm of consciousness. Phenomenology does not consider the phenomenal world to be made up solely of content. Instead, experience shows a constant tension between object and content within the phenomenal universe. This is surely Husserl's greatest philosophical insight, and we can explain what it means by contrasting it with what British empiricism says about objects. David Hume famously claimed that there was no such thing as unified objects in experience. What we call a grapefruit, for instance, is really just a bundle of qualities. We experience such qualities as spherical, soft, spongy, pulpy, sour, yellow, or pink, and internally sections. Our only immediate experience, according to Hume, is of these discrete qualities. From seeing these qualities go together regularly many times, we form the habit of thinking that there are things called grapefruits in the world, when in fact we only have evidence of qualities. This empiricist dogma, and it is a dogma, I'm afraid, is often subtly adopted even by those who are not otherwise followers of Hume. We still find traces of it in Brentano and Twardowski, especially the latter, when he describes experience as made up of contents, which really means the same thing as qualities. Husserl's most remarkable gesture was to treat the whole intentional object as prior to its parts. What we experience is not a bundle of qualities, but simply a grapefruit, and the grapefruit dominates those qualities, as if they were its servants or satellites. The grapefruit can be rotated in my hand, showing different qualities at different moments, yet I never stop thinking of it as the same grapefruit. I can view the fruit from behind, from a greater or lesser distance, first in full sunlight and later in shadow. In all these cases, the grapefruit does show different aspects, and it is therefore a different bundle of qualities. Yet it does not cease to be the same grapefruit. In fact, this is the very meaning of what Husserl calls in his technical term, eidetic reduction. By varying our perception of an object, either experientially or more often through imagination, we strip away the inessential qualities and arrive at those absolutely necessary qualities that the grapefruit cannot lose without ceasing to be this very grapefruit that it is. The fruit is not a bundle of qualities, but a nucleus that can support many variations in qualities, many abschattungen, or adumbrations, as he puts it. And yet the essential and inessential qualities of the grapefruit turn out to be of two vastly different kinds. First, there are the phenomenal qualities of the grapefruits, the exact pinkish or yellow hue of its interior, the precise sponginess of the spherical fruit as I squeeze it in my hand, the soft deadness of sound as I tweak it repeatedly with a fingernail, the wise and somber appearance of the fruit as it sits in the bowl of a still-like finger. Since all these qualities belong to the imminent phenomenal realm, we might call them intentional qualities, but for various reasons I prefer to call them sensual qualities. These sensual qualities are the accidental chaff that sip, shift atop the surface of any object, whirling like a kaleidoscope without changing that underlying object. Husserl speaks, for example, of my friend Hans, who can be encountered in just about any physical posture in any suit of clothing without changing the identity of Hans himself. These are sensual qualities. The sensual object is not hidden behind them, since we always have direct contact with Hans or a grapefruit, simply through the fact of acknowledging their presence. Instead, these sensual qualities are encrusted on the surface of the sensual object like feathers and rhinestones on a carnival samba dancer, who always remains the same dancer despite the wildest movements. But the truly pivotal qualities of a sensual object are not like this. Husserl admits that they cannot be perceived through the senses at all, but only through an intellectual or categorical act. It is not as if we perceive one million qualities on a level playing field and then chose three or four of them as the most important. Instead, all of the sensual qualities of a sensual object turn out to be unessential. The essential or eidetic qualities of an object are buried at a sub-sensual level, graspable only by the intellect. Oddly enough, this entails that the sensual object does not just have sensual qualities, but also has real qualities as well. This turns out to be rather paradoxical once we've taken a look at Heidegger, as we are now about to do. Heidegger, Husserl's star student, later a rebel against him, is famous for asking the question of the meaning of being, which is nowhere near as obscure as it sounds. Heidegger's own innovations are aimed against the idealism of Husserl's view that reality is based in phenomenal presence of the conscious mind. Beginning in his first university lecture course at the age of 29, Heidegger explains that for the most part, our way of dealing with things is not to be explicitly conscious of them. My minimal conscious activity in any given moment is rooted in a gigantic empire of items taken for granted. The oxygen I breathe, the ground that is currently free of earthquakes, the heart and lungs and kidneys that keep me alive, the English grammar I have now internalized and mastered and no longer struggle with. All of these things tend to vanish unnoticed into the background, 
as long as they are functioning efficiently. This, of course, is the famous tool analysis, first published in 1927 and being in time. The hammer and the bus route tend to remain invisible unless they malfunction. This is not just true of widely recognized tools, such as screwdrivers, wrenches, and axes. Instead, all objects are caught up in a reversal between silent functionality and explicit visibility. This is generally taken to mean that for Heidegger, all conscious theory is grounded in unconscious praxis. But this interpretation is superficial, since there is a deeper sense in which theory and praxis are exactly the same. In Heidegger's account, what happens when we hold the hammer and stare at it is that we have oversimplified the hammer. That is to say, we have reduced it to a tiny selection of its vast qualitative reality. The hammer has been turned into a caricature, a distortion, or at least a translation. But notice that exactly the same thing happens when we simply use a hammer rather than staring at it. To touch the hammer unconsciously does not exhaust its reality any more than staring at it does. The hand has as much finitude as the eye. Dogs and mosquitoes notice minuscule nuances of smell in the hammer that I myself can never detect. In other words, the supposedly mighty theory-praxis distinction isn't much of a distinction at all, at least not when it comes to ontology. Both conscious and unconscious human activity are equally guilty of failing to exhaust the reality of whatever they confront. The reality of objects is something deeper than either theoretical or practical human contact. But this can even be pushed one step further, and here's the controversial point, the ever-controversial point, to demonstrate that inanimate objects caricature, translate, and distort each other as well. The inability to touch the full depths of any given thing is not just some poignant psychological feature of human finitude. Objects fail to grasp each other to the bottom of their hearts just as much as we fail to grasp them. The fire burns cotton without ever having made contact with the color or smell of the cotton, stupidly limited as it is to the cotton's flammable features. Once we realize this, the philosophy of the human subject is in deeper peril than before. But since this theme is a digression from the topic of space and time, we can leave it for another occasion. Now, Heidegger does not like the term object, which he uses negatively for things reduced to appearances in human consciousness. Nor does Heidegger always think that the world is made up of a plurality of things, since he tends to treat the world of tool beings as a global relational system in which each thing gains reality from its references to other things. And in this way, all things for him tend to turn into a gigantic relational whole. But we don't need to follow him in either of these claims. The fact that individual entities can break for Heidegger means that they must have some private surplus deeper than the system of equipment. And there is no reason not to call them objects simply because Heidegger happens not to like that, world, that word. The word has a long and admirable tradition and was central to early phenomenology. In Husserl's case, we spoke of sensual objects. These are always directly before us rather than hidden or withdrawn. They are simply encrusted with superfluous information that must be stripped away to reach the truly essential features of the thing. If I perceive a mailbox, the sensual mailbox is directly there in front of me as soon as I acknowledge it, not hidden behind all the confusing details on its surface. But there is also the real mailbox, deeper than any access to it, and the sensual mailbox is merely a translation of it. This real object is withdrawn from relation, deeper than any contact that animate or inanimate objects might have with it. And since real objects are a surplus beyond any relation they might have with any other entities, it remains a mystery how they can make contact at all. Causation and influence more generally can only be indirect, never direct. And this is why I have called for a theory of vicarious causation, or indirect causation. But once again, this is a, a theme for another time. Earlier we saw that Husserl's sensual objects were in tension with two different kinds of qualities. The sensual accidental qualities that shift and swirl from one moment to the next without affecting the object to which they belong. And the real qualities that the object can never lose without falling out of existence. The same dual set of qualities can be found in Heidegger's real objects. Consider any entity insofar as it exists outside its relations, purely in its own right. Hammers, volcanoes, cargo ships, and birds cannot simply generate their individual qualities for the first time as soon as they come into contact with something else. The reason our encounters with each of these things is so different is because each of these objects has its own qualities and events. If each of them did not, then they would all be completely indistinguishable. Everything would be a feature of this perceptual lump. For this reason, real objects must have real qualities, apart from our perceiving them. But at the same time, real objects can also announce their presence through sensual qualities. This happens, for example, in the case of Heidegger's broken tool. The hammer that breaks is never directly before us. What we have instead are a specific shape, a grainy wooden texture, a partially damaged steel head, all of them sensual qualities and tension with an absent real hammer object. We now come to the goal of all these discussions of Husserl and Heidegger. There are two kinds of objects. 
not just autonomous things outside consciousness, but also durable units within perception that sustain many changes inside consciousness. Stated more simply, there are real objects and sensual objects. There are also two kinds of qualities. The sensual qualities that we experience directly and the real qualities that can never be sensed but only hinted at by some sort of intellectual categorical act that in my view, if not Husserl's, can never make these real qualities directly accessible in the flesh. These considerations lead us to a fourfold structure of real objects, real qualities, sensual objects, and sensual qualities. And though four terms can usually be paired up in six different ways, if we consider only those cases in which objects are in tension with their qualities, then we also have just four possible pairings to consider here. Real objects with real or sensual qualities, and sensual objects with real or sensual qualities. The reason this is relevant here is because these four tensions can be redescribed as time, space, essence, and ados, as I can explain easily enough. When we speak of a real thing in relation to its real qualities, the traditional name for this is essence, and there's no reason not to preserve this term, even though it is under attack for different reasons that do not concern us at the moment. As for ados, this is the term Husserl used for the relation a sensual object has with its real qualities accessible only to the intellect. That leaves us with sensual qualities and the relations they have to the two kinds of objects, and I hold that these relations are the metaphysical root of space and time. What leads us, for instance, to feel the passing flow of time? Whatever the neurological reason might be, the phenomenological reason is a sense of change with instability. The world does not seem to be reinvented anew at each instant. Instead, candles flicker and trees sway in the wind, dogs walk and trains rush past. If objects were really just bundles of qualities that change completely in each instant, there would be no continuity from one moment to the next. But the sense that time is passing is connected with the relative durability of units that support shifting perceptual configurations from one moment to the next. The flame that remains the same flame for us amidst all its contortions in the wind. The dog that remains the same dog, no matter the angle or distance from which we view him. This is time. Time is not an independent cosmic force driving things through some sort of flux or becoming irreducible to individual states. Instead, time is more like a distracting noise emitted by those individual states, which serves to mask the fact that quite often nothing is really happening at all. If the tension between real objects and their real qualities is called essence, that between sensual objects and their sensual qualities is the purely inessential or the accidental. Time, in the sense of our experience of the flow of time, is therefore the kingdom of the inessential, the site where nothing has happened yet. Turn that apple in your hand and toss it into the air. View it from five meters rather than three. Polish that apple a bit more. It hardly matters. An object is not a bundle of qualities, and therefore an object is not affected by trivial fluctuations on the surface of that bundle. But what about space? We said earlier that contra Leibniz, space is not the site of relation, but of both relation and non-relation. Real objects cannot relate directly, since they withdraw behind all possibility of direct contact. But indirect contact is inevitable, since objects do evidently affect each other. Sensual qualities are the ambassadors or emissaries of real objects that can never meet in person. Consider once again our experience of a broken hammer. Its various damaged qualities lie directly before us, subject to our inspection. Yet the hammer itself is still not here. It is or was something over and above these qualities. It formerly operates as a unit deeper than all its qualities. The hammer is not present in consciousness, but belongs to a different place, even though it still makes contact with us through the medium of its sensual qualities. If space is the tension between distance and nearness, then there is no better exemplar of this than an object that withdraws from direct contact even while leaving its qualities behind to confront us directly. In terms of object-oriented philosophy, space and time are the two tensions concerned with sensual qualities, just as essence and ados pertain to real qualities. Let's see if this can tell us anything about the subtemporal and subspatial character of objects. Treating space and time as different dimensions of reality, as I proposed here, seems to run counter to 20th century physics. Four-dimensional space-time was touched upon by Einstein and formulated explicitly by Gronkowski in 1908, and has enjoyed an illustrious career in physics ever since. But we cannot tie philosophical speculation to the state of the sciences at any given moment. Science should be an inspiration for philosophy rather than a straitjacket. Consider, for example, the views of Lee Smolin, who in The Life of the Cosmos laments the days, misses the days, when philosophers actually challenge the sciences. And in The Trouble with Physics, he shares his hunch that space and time might need to be decoupled again for further progress in physics to occur. At any rate, philosophy must be free to speculate about space, space and time on the basis of its own internal concerns. Who is to say what the physics of a half century now will look like, and whether it will continue to function so independently of metaphysics as it has for the past 50 years? For mapping the two kinds of objects and two kinds of qualities, it turned out that they yield the four tensions of time, space, essence, and ados. 
What time and space have in common is their link with sensual qualities rather than real ones. And what is most characteristic of sensual qualities is their purely accidental nature. For Husserl, since the mailbox of the blackbird is not a bundle of qualities, these sensual objects do not need any particular configuration of qualities in order to be what they are. We can watch the blackbird fly from any number of angles and distances and under any imaginable lighting conditions, whether twilight, sunrise, even under strobe lights or illuminated with lasers. And we look straight through these variations of the blackbird as an underlying unit of our experience that does not change. And for Heidegger, since real, uh, real objects such as hammers are deeper than any of their sensual manifestations, the hammer cannot be identified either with the specific details of its shattering, its precise obtrusive heaviness, the exact arbitrary color of its handle, or other such features. The hammer announces itself through breaking and calling attention to various qualities that announce it, but the hammer is never built out of these visible qualities. Instead, it withdraws into subterranean shadow, which no gaze can penetrate even partially. It is quite different with real qualities, such as the essence of a concealed hammer, or the eidos of an apple, or pear, experienced by consciousness. In both cases, these qualities are essential to the object in question, and hence there is no room for maneuver. Change the real qualities of a real or sensual object, and you have quite simply destroyed that object and turned it into something else. But space and time are concerned only with the inessential, and paradoxically, this gives them a tremendous degree of power. Insofar as the sensual qualities of a real or sensual object shift wildly within a wide range of variation, these sensual qualities are the sole emissaries of change in the world. It is a deeply classical principle, in the good sense of classical, that nothing can change its essence, but everything can change its accidents. Insofar as we want to discover how change occurs in the world, or what prevents the world from becoming a static garden of unmoving statues, we need to look at the sensual or the inessential. A related principle has been familiar in sociology since the early 1970s, the so-called strength of weak links. From our family and closest associates, we are often rewarded with loyalty, emotional support, repositories for deeply held secrets, and supportive ears for our complaints of mistreatment. Yet there is also something static and repetitive about such relations, which in a sense are already everything that they can be. Rewarding those such relationships are, in some respects, they are resistant to change. It is different with casual relations, which may lack much in terms of trust, loyalty, and intimacy, but which provide a wealth of avenues into possible new opportunities, or even into entirely new worlds. It is such a good analogy that we might even borrow the phrase, the strength of weak links, to describe the weak links that any object has with its sensual qualities, in opposition to the strong and intimate bond of loyalty that it enjoys with its real ones. Weakness may be the genuine agent of change in the world. Somewhere Levinas describes violence as the attempt to control what is strong in someone through what is weak in them. But this turns out to be true of causal links in general, rather than just the ones we call violent. Although space and time both have connections with sensual qualities, there is a basic asymmetry between them. Qualities never exist in a vacuum, but are always the servants or lackeys of some objects. Merleau-Ponty is perhaps even stronger than Husserl at showing that a quality such as green is not an isolated objective wavelength of light, but that the exact same wavelength of green appears very differently, depending on whether it is the green of glass, ink, a shirt, or the fluorescent lights on a mosque. In each of these cases, the character of the object infects the quality itself. Sensual qualities always belong to objects, but the objects to which they belong are sensual objects, not real ones. There is no bundle of qualities, but a primordial bond between sensual objects and their sensual qualities. Initially, we encounter them as belonging together. Our instinctive common sense approach to sensual objects is to view them lazily as bundles of qualities. I turn an object around in my hands, and after seeing it from all sides, I am quietly satisfied that I have exhausted the thing by experiencing the sum total of its qualities. But now and then we do experience a separation or fission between the sensual object and its qualities. In these cases, we suddenly grasp that the sensual object is not a bundle of sensual qualities, but an autonomous source capable of generating new qualities under different conditions. This often occurs with delightfully variable objects such as kaleidoscopes and holograms, or even with electronic toys that utter different random phrases whenever a button is pushed. But in a non-technological context, we know such cases through simple natural experiences, such as watching the light fade over rural landscapes, observing the changing colors of the Taj Mahal every few minutes at dawn, or following the shifting adventures of a fictional character. A good general name for all of these phenomena would be simulation. Although this word is increasingly associated with computer models, the phenomenon of simulation is much more general. We have a simulation whenever we isolate the basic underlying principle in any given situation and try to generate the results of this principle in counterfactual situations. What might Baudelaire have written if he were a San Francisco beat poet instead of a post-romantic Frenchman? How would German philosophy have differed if instead of eliminating Kant's thing in itself as the German idealist did, it had instead eliminated Kant's fixation on the human world pair and extended the phenomenal numinal split to inanimate nature? 
how might World War III in Europe have played out in 1985? I actually read such a study authored by NATO. What if we reverse the nationalities of Henri Bergson and William James? How would this have affected their philosophies? What if I had accepted job Z rather than job X? Or on a humbler level, how would this pair look if I viewed it from the other side of the kitchen rather than from here? We have simulation any time we break the usual bond between a sensual object and its customary range of qualities so that the object is grasped as an underlying unit capable of moving into different contexts and yielding different results about which one can speculate. Sensual objects and sensual qualities are united when they arrive on the scene and it is our job to split them apart. In doing so, we come to see that the sensual object is subtemporal, not to be identified with the shifting on its surface that gives a sense of dynamic temporal flow, since we have seen that these shifts are irrelevant to the sensual object. One implication of calling objects subtemporal is that we must embrace what in the philosophy of time is sometimes called presentism. The Elan Vital, so beloved by Bergson, the primordial becoming of Deleuze and Guattari, looks from our standpoint only like qualitative noise. Most becoming leads nowhere. Most flux is a surface effect without exit. Sensual objects are relatively durable units that change or perish infrequently. The river of Heraclitus is still there, but there are stones in the river, and those stones are not altered or destroyed automatically every time a bit of water passes. The becoming of the stones is a very special case that requires work, not an entitlement for everything that exists. We have to earn our becoming. But if sensual objects are subtemporal, we cannot even call them subspatial, since they have nothing to do with space at all. Insofar as objects are sensual, we are in direct contact with all of them. Even distant towers, forests, and mountains in perception are in immediate contact with us insofar as we recognize them. As John Locke already knew, distance is inferred rather than seen in perception. And in fact, babies must learn that they cannot grab everything with an eyesight and cannot touch the moon with their hands simply because they touch it with their eyes. The situation between real objects and sensual qualities is completely different. Here, there is no pre-existent bond between the two. If we notice the qualities of a hammer, we link these qualities with the sensual object directly before us. Normally, we do not link them with some withdrawn subterranean hammer thing hiding in the dusk of the world. True, there is always a link insofar as some real object must generate the sensual qualities of the broken hammer. But the real object with which we link those qualities need not be the same one that generates the qualities. For example, if I suddenly find the hammer too heavy, this might not be the result of the hammer itself, but of a strange degenerative disease by which I am gradually weakened. Or I may be unusually ignorant of tools and blame the broken hammer for what is actually the work of a broken mallet. Or I may be delusional and curse the broken hammer when what I actually hold in my hand is a plastic toy. If these examples seem outlandish and contrived in the context of hammers, there are more credible examples, such as mistaken inferences in scientific work, false conspiracy theories that miss the true conspiracy, or shoddy historical work that weighs cause and effect incorrectly. The point of these examples is simply to note that the link between sensual qualities and real objects does not just flow from the objects to the qualities, as when Kant says that there must be noumena to generate the phenomena. It also flows in reverse from qualities to objects. When a hammer breaks, to use Heidegger's most famous example, there is a transfer of qualities to a new and unseen object. Previously, we saw the sensual qualities of the hammer in a bond or union with the sensual object hammer. But now those qualities are reassigned to an object entirely outside our grasp. The malfunction of the hammer does not make the hammer present, but calls our attention to its absence. The real hammer is not made up of the obtrusive qualities that announce its breakdown, but lies at a layer much deeper than those qualities or any other qualities. The broken hammer does not give us any more knowledge of hammers than a reliably functional hammer does, but at least it strips hammer qualities away from a sensual object and assigns them to an absent real one. There is something unsettling about this experience, something that is lacking in the playful and addictive expectancy of simulation. It is unnerving to be alerted to an object that cannot be pinned down to any qualities at all, but merely shatters all accessible qualities. This is not a matter of simulation like the previous case. In simulation, we think we have a fairly good grasp of what the sensual object is, and simply apply it to numerous additional counterfactual cases. In the new case just described, the real objects lying behind sensual qualities, we barely have a grasp of the object at all. We can do nothing more than allude to the object, and for this reason I have often spoken of the related noun allure. There is allure whenever we sense a real object in impossible fusion with sensual qualities. Only here do we get a sense of space, because only here is there any distance. Locke was right to claim that there is no space to be found in perception where everything is immediate. And this space need not be physical, but encompasses every form of distance. The showcase of example of allure would surely be artworks, which cannot in any sense be paraphrased. A prose, sorry, a prose summary of visual art or literature cannot replace the work itself, unless that work is of the most negligible quality, or unless such replacement is itself meant as a conceptual artwork. 
an especially beautiful landscape or jewel gives the sense of a disembodied force that is even deeper than the already startling qualities it displays. In cases of extreme courage, we see a force of character deeper than the venal calculations normally required by the relations between people and things. In cases of disappointment, the same thing happens for the opposite reason. A feeble underlying thing or human character now seems to have generated accidental qualities of which it was never really worthy. If space is the interplay of distance and nearness, then real objects are subspatial because they never approach us in nearness but withdraw beyond any attempt to grasp them directly via qualities. As for time, we cannot even recall real objects subtemporal because they are not immersed in the stream of time at all, but erupt into the flow of time as if from another world, not a platonic other world of eternal perfect things, but a secular underworld of fragile, destructible, imperfect, but beautiful things. One frequent critique of recent civilization is that it turns everything into a simulation and that the reality principle is thereby lost. Baudrillard is condemned, condemned for turning the Gulf War and 9-11 from cases of genuine human suffering into hypnotic media events. Police and even insurance companies are criticized for predicting future behavior or future liability on the basis of statistical models. Preemptive war causes outrage since it responds not to actual events but to possible scenarios of aggression by the enemy that must be cut off in advance. Video games are blamed for the inability of two entire generations to distinguish illusion from reality. But in terms of the fourfold model of object oriented philosophy, simulation can be viewed as a detemporalization since it no longer lets sensual objects run their course in the normal flow of shifting qualities, but turns them into an extra temporal source of variation that can be mastered in a material form. By contrast, allure cannot be viewed as a kind of despatialization since it is the only experience that produces space at all. Without allure, there is no space, but only withdrawn objects cut off from one another, as in the occasional theologies of past centuries. If the era of simulation is accused of stripping reality from the contemporary world, allure cannot possibly be accused of this since it is the source of an unparalleled heightening of reality. The destruction of time will be countered not by a reconstruction of time, but by a production of space. Instead of the Heideggerian cliché of citing Holderlund's where the danger is, there too lies the saving power, we will be claiming the opposite, that simulation is the danger and allure is the saving power, and that the two have nothing to do with each other except for their common link in sensual qualities. Warhol's age of simulation would give way to an era of allure, and the extraterritorial will be the reality principle, objects not localizable in any given place because they punch holes in every place they touch.